sort of talk about then is, is really the, the sort of two things. One is potential for rural innovation, which is based on our paper. Um, and then the, the uh, options for rural health system reform. And we'll go along with it. You'll see off to the side, you'll see photos uh, throughout. The photos throughout are um, from our rural research uh, exchange, um, which is through what's called, we call the free range program. Uh, this is funded by, by Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, and uh, it's to facilitate international knowledge exchange on the well-being of rural communities. So not just health, but well-being in general. Those of you who know rural communities, particularly small rural communities, um, you can't look at health and at health in isolation. Similarly, you can't look at economic development in isolation. One needs to sort of look across disciplines. So free range uh, is designed for this knowledge exchange, and really that's sort of three goals. Number one, we call to breed better students. So we do field-based interchange. This field-based interchange has obviously not happened during the pandemic because we can't travel internationally. But collegial support is certainly and online stuff has continued. Develop approaches to difficult problems, health innovation being one of them, uh, and then just to enhance rural research partnerships. So, um, so yes, the photos are from uh, Australia, um, Canada, uh, and Sweden. Uh, from different our different field interchanges that we have throughout there from different rural villages. So um, this paper that was recently published in uh, Frontiers in Public Health, uh, really what the purpose of this was to was to examine the potential for health and care, so not just health services, but health and social care services in small rural places. And um, so the potential to identify and implement innovations in service delivery. So what might the potential be for these places to actually in to, to, to innovate and develop innovative solutions? Um, and so the question then would be sort of under what conditions can these services take responsibility for designing and implicating their new service models that meet local needs? And so this is really looking at rural driven, community driven type uh, um, uh, models. So one thing of note, just so the slides have a little more text on them than I would normally do if I was doing this orally. But since we're all on computer screens at home, it's generally easier to read them So uh, for people. So they'll have a little more text and I'll probably go a little bit quicker. I just find that with online, people are able to, to, to look at it a little bit faster. But if there's any problems, you can raise a hand. You can just say, slow down. Um, my students do that. So for rural innovation, um, really sort of backing it up, the ability for local services in rural communities to be able to act autonomously really should be seen as a critical part of community-based care paradigms and part of social responsibility. Um, so the paradigms need, the paradigms emphasize the need for services to understand what the communities which they operate and to tailor what they do to the needs of the community. So what we're talking about is we're talking about acting autonomously within community-based care stuff for within the rural places themselves. So with organizations that understand the locales and understand those communities. Um, given the diversity of rural communities that we found through our research, so the idea that you know, when you know, when you've seen one rural community, you know that one rural community, they're all different, right? There's a very diversity between this. So from, you know, a New Brunswick context, right? So we've got, you know, McAdam is much different uh, than, uh, I don't know, Shediac or something like that, right? So these little communities are very, very different. Um, uh, and so the services in those communities should operate differently than the services even nearby. So even though a community might be 100 kilometers or 50 kilometers away, um, or even 25 kilometers away, um, they may operate differently and should, given the nature of the communities. And so there's a tension then between allowing sufficient local autonomy to develop this responsive services, as well as maintaining higher level standards mandated by regional, provincial, uh, um, governments. And so 
the value of this research and what we're trying to do is sort of to understand and potentially resolve some of this tension, right? To be able to sort of unpack some of these arguments. So our study, um, uh, what we did is the pandemic really presented us with some interesting opportunities, sort of a natural experiment type thing, where we were already engaged in community-based researchers. We had um, students uh, who lived and, and, and worked in rural areas who, who many cases went home. Um, and uh, so we had experience and knowledge of these different places. And so what we did is we engaged with our essentially our, our students, our collaborators and our researchers in Australia, Canada, Sweden, and the United States. It's reflected in the authorship. And we wanted to focus on rural communities we're calling villages. So those with less than 5,000 residents. So most of them are much smaller than 5,000 residents. So generally sort of around 1,000 or less. Particularly those isolated from major service centers. So more than about, more than a couple hours from a major city, right? With a, um, let's say a, a, a trauma care, you know, a trauma hospital. Um, and then what we did is we did ethnographic essentially and auto ethnographic within home communities. So some people living within those communities examine those communities themselves. And we wanted to do research from a service user perspective. So we had our researchers essentially create what we call village vignettes from a service user perspective, asking sort of a variety of locations, a variety of questions. So this is roughly where we were, Eastern rural Ontario, Nova Scotia, um, New Hampshire, Vermont, right sort of the edge of there, Northern Sweden, uh, and then uh, Australia, both South Australia, and I believe we had some communities in Queensland as well. Um, and we wanted to sort of look at what were the service model responses to the pandemic, and to what extent could local service managers customize those responses to meet the needs of their communities in health and social care communities. And we wanted to, within that, emphasize the role of power and external actors to the community. So external actors, both in terms of private, um, uh, but also in terms of different levels of government. Um, and then the community is also the community members themselves. So not just service managers, but also community members and residents. So we developed an impact domain framework, and this was developed, co-developed by researchers many of whom are community members, some are practitioners, right, practicing in rural communities, to look at a variety of different things, including looking at patient risk, service design and innovation, workforce, stakeholder engagement. So we look sort of along the health and social care communities. Um, uh, and we did this sort of um, uh, for, for each space, which then allowed us to create sort of a, a database of different villages with about minimum of three villages within each sort of regional context. And so this sort of shows you the, the, the different elements that we've looked at. Um, our results we divided into what we call the, the how and the what. Um, uh, our results on the one hand could be thought of as fairly theoretic, theoretical, um, and, and Sam will get into that uh, a little bit a little bit later but we wanted to bridge the theory with what we call the, the actual, how do you do it? And, and why, you know, what do we need to do? So the how framework, um, uh, they're not actually acronyms, by the way, they're just capitalized. So in case you're looking for acronyms, they're not acronyms. Um, they're just emphasized with capitals. Um, so local autonomy in, in rural health, we, we found, um, based on the, the research from the pandemic and then also from, from literature, that local autonomy can be compromised by many structural factors and it is compromised, including, and these are things that those of you who know, know rural health and care services, you know, workforce turnover, limited funding, tensions between levels of governments, medical legal concerns, right? Um, lack of access to information and knowledge, risk aversion, we sort of say latent inertia, so like the needing to get up and go, now, some of these changed, of course, during the pandemic, right? Uh, due to necessity, really. Um, in highly regulated systems in general, so if you're thinking 
pre-pandemic especially, it can be difficult um, to innovate locally and to implement these new services, particularly the case in, in rural areas where you have this fragility, right? Due to some of the, some of the, the, the notions that we, that we mentioned before. Um, uh, um, the, there was a lot of evidence of, of some really significant innovation. Um, one comes from Renfrew County in Canada. This is what they call the, the, the Renfrew County Virtual Triage um, uh, and Assessment Center. So it's, it's still running. It was something they had an idea in before, but uh, they had an idea of before, but within a short matter of months, they moved from uh, just a phone service. And so this is a locally based service for um, residents of Renfrew County, where you can do a, essentially you can log into the emergency room and do a video appointment or telephone appointment. So rather than having to go to the emergency room yourself. Um, and as we know in rural communities, there's not a lot of walk-in centers. So whereas in urban areas, we have about 20% of people seek care through walk-in um, for immediate concerns. In rural areas, that same number go to the emergency room because there's not walk-in centers. So if they need if they need immediate care, getting into a family physician is hard. So this was a response to that. And it's been quite popular, written up um, uh, there, and it's designed to sort of serve. And, and it's, you know, they wanted to do it before to, to serve rural residents, but it's been quite that. And it's funded um, through a collaboration. So uh, it's funded by not just the county, um, which operates the, the hospital, but it's also funded by a community foundation. It's funded by business groups. So it's funded by a larger number of groups. And so it's collaborative. Um, so. There needs to be a to, 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 to enable this innovation, there needs to be a policy environment that encourages local actors to make decisions about their services, whatever those aspects that might be. So moving to a virtual care facility or innovating services to continue group care in Sweden and Australia. So there we have some evidence um, uh, um, about group care practices uh, rather, you know, um, uh, which were influenced by the pandemic. Uh, and in some cases, we found it certainly in, in uh, US and Canada, those were just canceled. So as you know, many services were just canceled. Uh, but here they were innovated and they changed uh, to be able to allow those to continue um, through local innovations. Um, there also needs to be, as you guys know, this local leadership and champions, right? Central to what's known as innovation capacity. This isn't, I don't think this is sort of a, an unknown, you guys wouldn't, uh, you guys would, would, would recognize that. There also needs to be sort of what we call collective mechanisms through which local actors and decision makers can engage with the communities and manage those partnerships with the communities and with the external actors. So looking at it at multiple levels, right? Um, so they need to have some sort of mechanism by which this can happen, this, this knowledge exchange, and then this partnership collaboration. And so this includes both policymakers and the downstream service providers, family physicians, uh, psychologists, um, social workers, um, uh, people working at the food bank, uh, volunteering to drive seniors to the, you know, to their appointments. All these types of things that happen, or even just uh, um, library services, right? Lots of community stuff happens at the library. Um, so as we saw, you know, the pandemic required rapid change. We all remember it's still top of mind, right? It was a pivot quickly within a week. Um, meaning that service managers had to like draw on what we call the ab ab absorptive capacity, which Sam will go into details on what that we mean for that. So the speed and the way that it was implemented reflect an important part of this how framework. And sit sort of above and move into this what framework as sort of evidence of preparedness. So the ability of local communities to just pivot. Um, and some communities weren't. Some communities uh, didn't pivot. Services were closed. Um, there was a longer period of time where just nothing was available. The municipal center was closed. That's it, right? No information on the website, no information on Facebook, nothing like that, 
right? Uh, no posters up around town. Uh, and in some places it was immediately online. There was emails, there was Facebook, there was Twitter, there was all these sort of things about how these things changed. And so even though they may not have been planning for a pandemic, they did have this absorptive capacity by, by which people could respond. And I think that's really important because in a small place that people have multiple roles. So like a service manager is also gonna be, you know, on the parent committee, will also have kids at the school, will perhaps even own a home business. You know, they'll be doing lots of sort of things and they're pulled in multiple directions. So the ability to have that capacity in a real life community is, is really good. You don't always have a, a team at work to be able to rely on that. If you can't come in, someone else in your team will do it. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and so our, our what framework moving to this, so what actually, not just what sort of responses might they implement, uh, um, uh, but what might be visible to communities and service users. And so the preparedness talked about the speed of innovation. Um, and a lot of this was sort of along the lines of provision of information. And this is both guidance information and then public health information. So the public health alerts and then guidance on to what to actually do. Um, physical and procedural changes, the adoption of new digital communication technologies, and then coordination between service providers. You know, I, I remember actually just, it's not a, a rural community thing, but I do remember they, um, how St. John, I, I, you know, New Brunswick had the hospital changed the whole flow of people, how people flowed into the building, into the ER and around. They completely altered that, which as you know, in a hospital is no small feat, but did that really quickly. That information was available you know, immediately. It was circulated to, to people in the community. It was available online. Um, I'm assuming when people made an appointment, it was also available. So this is sort of what we mean by this was available. And then some places we looked at some, some health clinics just, you know, literally had nothing. There was no, in, no information. And so if you were to call, you get a voice message or something like that, because we did call places as well. They had no information on the voice message or online, right? So you would call and there's no information on the message either. So, um, and then, uh, you know, adoption of new digital communications. Is this just by phone? Are they now adopting an e-health system? Uh, you know, a, a video conference? Um, are they using other things such as, uh, you know, now having digital charts? Um, do they then coordinate between service providers? So how do you get your chart or requisition from one person to the other person to the, to the pharmacy or something like that without having to bring a physical copy, right? And it's only recently I was, I had some lab work done, you know, at some, at early in the pandemic, some blood work. That's the first time I ever got a digital copy of my blood work without having to pay the private company to do it, right? Because they never did. It was always just a paper copy. And because I was trying to find my old versions of it. And sure enough, I'd taken photos of the paper copies uh, at one point, right? But, and you're thinking like, really? Because you know it's digital. <laughs> Anyways. So there's three main types of local action, particularly with adopting e-health technologies, right? So that we can do, that, that, sorry, for services, health services. Number one, adopting e-health technologies. Just what I said, a variety of those sort of things. Changing the service structures. So having different types of services, professionals change how they work together. So whether it's, it's you know, different health teams and integrating with other things, but also maybe integrating with other things such as the municipality, the, the, the community service or social workers that they may not have had as much um, uh, uh, coordination with before. Changing how your physical infrastructure is used. Obviously the pandemic required some distancing and things like that. Um, uh, but, you know, then it's like, well, maybe we need to adapt some of our spaces rather than being group meeting spaces to being individual places. Allowing for internet connection at the library so people who didn't have fast home internet to go use those. And then establishing configuration of the service to target specific populations. And this is particularly the case for, for, for the older adults, right? Um, and the elderly are, are those in, in, in care facilities where we know they were hit really hard with the pandemic, but also we needed to target those with multiple services uh, in a way that was sort of safe. Um, and then changing funding models or how funds are used. This is really important. Um, you know, example in Ontario uh, was, um, 
you know, e-health consults were always available to be billed through a special code, uh, but they weren't billed at anywhere near the rate as an in-person consult. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously that's not going to work when everyone's doing e-health. And so they did change the funding model temporarily. Um, uh, and, I, you know, that's been in negotiation, but they were able to pivot that quite quickly. Uh, on, on and other countries did that as well. Australia and, and Sweden also did that um, as sort of rem remuneration to that um, and sort of how that was done. Also then providing funds to certain organizations. Um, so some local evidences we have, you know, then cases where some health services, which is group counseling services, right? So we have a counseling group closed completely for a period of time nothing really on offer that we can sort of say. In terms of new clients, maybe they, their existing clients, they did offer counseling, but there's no, there was no information available on any websites or phone messages about how to get new counseling services, which during a pandemic is not particularly ideal. Um, other cases where new stuff was provided as soon as it was announced, right? So when you're a period of change where processes and procedures happens quickly, you know, this, this, this was announced right away, or sometimes even advanced, right? You know, there will be updates coming this Friday, kind of thing. Um, not just the strategic leaks that the government likes to do about, you know, our government just did this today about, you know, we are going, you know, it's going to announce the lifting of mask mandates, but of course it leaks it before they actually announce it. Not just meaning that, but just that, you know, there's actually expert knowledge of this. Um, and so this is, this provision of information is really a cornerstone of like what local actors can do effectively. Um, and then this, this coordination at multiple levels. So really some of the lessons we can draw from these rural vignettes, um, uh, you know, from the theoretical perspective, um, rural, organization, rural organizations are already familiar with uncertainty, right? They often have limited funding and it's often temporary. So usually smaller funding when they asked for, generally not long-term funding. They have small long-term funding base. A lot of rural organizations are going from funding call to funding call, right? There's a three-year program on this. There's a two-year program on this. Um, and they're often uh, you know, going from, from funding to funding. There's often a high turnover of the professional workforce um, or it's difficult to recruit new professionals, um, professional staff, and not just in terms of you know, physicians, uh, that's only one part of the story, as 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 you all know. Like, you need you know getting a qualified office manager is really key, right? Um, or nurse practitioners, or a physiotherapist, or a naturopath, or massage therapist, right? And then shifting priorities of government. Don't need to tell you guys that. If you guys are in policy or government, we know that things shift and things change, and we're kind of a bit at the whim of them. But they change, and so how do rural organizations shift with that? Sometimes rural is not even mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, they're often sort of not thought of in these prisons. So communities have developed already what we call this high absorptive capacity, given a frequent need to adapt. And so a pandemic can show us that where the, that, that happens. So operationally, we see that there needs to be a few things. Number one, collaboration and connection, which we've talked about, right? collaborating in new ways, connecting with multiple levels, but also, so not just internally, but also multiple levels. Both things need to occur. There needs to be a familiarity and knowledge of local community environments, right? Each rural place is unique. Um, and then creativity in how, what limited resources you have are managed and adapted. So how can we make use of the resources that we have? Whether it's, well, you know, we can use some of the funding that we would normally do for these in-person visits, and we can take that and put it elsewhere and adapt them to there. And then acceptance and development of new technologies. So, um, uh, you know, embracing new things when they come in, um, uh, you know, and trying them out. Right? Um, uh, we're often people are often hesitant to change how they do work, um, uh, particularly, you know, practitioners. This is the way you sort of do it, but this quickly required everyone to change. And those that accepted it and then indeed developed it and made it their own were most successful. So, you know, we like to say, well, here's the e-health platform that everyone should be using. 
but that's not really, you know, that wasn't what we found uh, was necessarily best. Some communities that might not work. Some communities have a very active community center that's a hub for everybody. And maybe internet, as in the case of the, in Australia, rural internet is, is, they like to complain about the rural internet and everything they complain about is true. Um, New Brunswick has great rural internet compared to Australia, just so you know. Um, uh, so they've developed all sorts of different ways of doing that. So you gotta use the cell phone sometimes because that's the best way you can access the online is, is, is the cell phone, right? Or you stand on top of your building with the Wi-Fi with, with the tower. Um, so really what we've shown is that rural health systems can really be the, the locus, the loci of, of adaptation and innovation, right? With a mix of local autonomy, strong service community connections, this high absorptive capacity and evidence what we call organizational anti-fragility.